This is Brother Julius on the Just Word Show. One more time, we're always, always glad to be here to share from the Word of God a revelation, a nugget of truth, a word of encouragement, and sometimes even a word of exhortation. Exhortation to do better and exhortation to go further and to run faster. So we, we just come to uh, to drop a few nuggets on you of wisdom and sometimes kingdom truth and revelation. Right here on the Just Word Show, we're very, very happy and very, very excited that you decided to join us right here on Awesome God Radio. Sometimes you may see us on Facebook. You might be listening on uh, Awesome God Radio or you might be watching on YouTube. However it is that you uh, check us out, we're thankful that you give us this opportunity. We're not going to uh, prelude the show too much because we are absolutely chalked full. We're chock full with Bible verses and we're chock, chock full with uh, with information and nuggets of truth that will bless you and uh, and just give you something to consider in the Lord. So my, uh, I do want to say some I want to say something. We don't want to pre- prelude too long. I, I want to drop something and then I'm going to let my wife make an announcement. And it's this right here. It's uh, I want you to be encouraged, friends, to go all the way through the Bible and read it for yourself so that you will be so familiar with the truth that when something when something counterfeit presents itself, you can recognize it instantaneously. That is very, very important that you know truth for yourself. That's mm-hmm. what we always talk about on the show. Um in fact, we're going to talk about a topic tonight that many in the body of Christ have misconstrued. But you don't have to have it misconstrued if you simply read what the scriptures say on the topic. Yes. Okay, so I'm about to turn it over to my wife, and uh, she's going to drop some announcements on you, and then we're going to jump right in with both feet on the ground mm-hmm. running. Hello. Actually, it's just one very, very special announcement. Um, I would like to invite you, our Just Word family, to be our guest at the fifth annual Victory Celebration and Fundraiser Dinner. Uh, we have it every year. This is our fifth year. Um, we are celebrating what the Lord is doing um, through Fellowship of Christian Athletes um, and the FCA Park Heights Saints. Um, it is our hope that you will come and be our guest and be inspired and enjoy a great meal um, along with our coaches and athletes and the community. This event will be held at uh, 5000 Radicky Avenue. Um, that's actually at Mount Pleasant Church and Ministries in the uh, Fellowship Hall. There is no cost to attend. Um, however, as I said before, it is a fundraiser um so please be prayerful about uh uh, the amount that the lord lays on your heart that you want to give um to support that ministry um for those of you who have heard about this obviously you you, you've heard about it via a flyer or email or social media um or even perhaps another radio station so to register or to find out more about this wonderful event um, BaltimoreFCA.org. And perhaps you have heard about it and you wish you could attend, but you have prior obligations. So uh, perhaps you could make a financial donation to support the ministry. Um, and again, you would visit BaltimoreFCA.org. Um, or perhaps you have some additional time and talents you'd like to share with the ministry. Um, again, you can visit the website and you'll see all the information there of how to get involved and how to help. So again, we would like to invite you to join us on April 29th. That's a Monday. It's from 6 to 9, 5000 Radicky Avenue. That's Mount Pleasant Church and Ministries in the Fellowship Hall, beautiful Fellowship Hall. Beautiful dinner, a wonderful program. You'll be inspired and blessed. Please, please, please join us, BaltimoreFCA.org, to register. Okay, friends, I would just want to help you with this. The Fellowship of Christian Athletes is an yes. incredible, incredible organization. They have reached countless thousands of youths um, and, and even adults as well. Yes. From coaches to soccer players to Mm -hmm. baseball players to basketball players, professional football players, all different types 
of athletes and they're praying with them and they're going into the school systems, the various different school systems and praying with the young people, winning souls for Christ, changing lives, not only for time, but also for eternity, making a major, yes, major difference. And um, if you have the opportunity to uh, to put your hands to this Christian plow, then I, by all means, I certainly would encourage you to yes. do so, or at least to look into it, even if you could uh, write them a check or even if, or send a, sow a seed, uh, however it is that you yes. can do, whatever you can do. This is an organization that is certainly making a difference in the lives of young, young people. One of my best friends, um, he was an athlete in high school and he became, uh, he was a part of the fellowship of Christian mm-hmm. athletes and it made a major difference in his life. Um, uh, and, and just, I, we could just go on and on about how great of an yes. organization that absolutely is. And so, I wanted to say my, just one last thing is that um, sometimes people are a little bit taken back by the fact that it's uh, for athletes and coaches. But, you know, the vision of, of FCA is to see the world transform through the influence of coaches and athletes, through the influence of sports, um, yeah. kind of help the athlete um, to, one, uh, encounter Christ and then have a thriving and developing relationship, <clears throat> a growing relationship with the Lord. So. Even if you're not an athlete, um, please don't let that uh, keep you back or uh, keep you feeling um, like it's not something that you would enjoy um, any time that um, there's an opportunity um, for you to uh, be evangelical, to advance the gospel with your time, talent or treasure. Um, and this is a, this is good ground. This is good ground um, to sow into. So um, I just want to encourage you. Um, and if you come out that night, I guarantee you, you will be inspired and you will be blessed and you will want to be a part of what the Lord is doing through FCA. You know, uh, you don't have to be an athlete, but I will add this. I'm glad that Paul, uh, by the revelation of the Holy Spirit, uses the example of a body. Because the kingdom of God is set up like a body and the various different body parts have different functions. And so it is with God's kingdom and the various different constituents. Those of us who are in God's kingdom, I'm sitting here behind the microphone because in my heart there has been deposited a word of uh, of revelation from the scriptures. And there is an ability to communicate revelations there is there is an ability to receive and understand the word and and there's a burden on my heart that god's people would know the truth of his word and that god's people would be driven and encouraged and exhorted to learn the word that's just my one place in the body but the body needs multiple things yes the body needs uh, janitors. The body needs musicians. The body needs songwriters. Amen. And whatever realm of influence you're in, that is your realm of influence. I mean, you can be an, a, an attorney mm-hmm. who happens to be a Christian. You can be a plumber who happens to be a Christian. You can be a electrician or a mason or a painter or a secretary or a CEO of a large business or a small business. I mean, a truck driver. Wherever it is, you take the Lord with you and you function in your place in the body of Christ. What it is that the spirit have led and gifted you to do. Amen. So uh, fellowship of Christian athletes are in a perfect, perfect position to to touch uh, high school athletes mm-hmm. and college athletes and even professional athletes yes. and even coaches. Because coaches oftentimes have just as much influence over the young athletes as their parents do. So, uh, you know, what better way to break off a, uh, even if you lose a baseball game, to gather in a circle in prayer and say, Lord, thank you that all of us stayed safe. And, and, and whatever it is that they do in their, their prayers and their huddles and their Bible studies, it's just a beautiful thing, a tremendous tool for evangelism. And, um, And building Christian character. Look, friends, we're going to jump right into the word of God. We are absolutely chock full. I don't know how much of this I'm going to get because it's so heavy and it's so much. So we know, friends, right here, uh, this is April uh, April 18th. It is. Or 17th? 18th. 18th. And we're coming around to... 
what many, and I'm going to put in air quotes, the Christian church call Easter. Some call it Resurrection Sunday. Mm -hmm. And for my Jewish friends, you call it the Feast of First Fruits. Yes. And for those of us who are Christians, I, I, uh, I say, um, I say Easter. I personally don't like the term Easter. I personally don't like to celebrate Easter just because I am a student of history and I understand that the term itself is a pagan term. Many of the practices that we have mingled in with the so-called Christian church mm -hmm. um, have become pagan and they were pagan in their origin. The name Easter itself is actually a pagan term, mm -hmm. uh, literally named after a uh, a Babylonian goddess named Ishtar. Uh, Jesus never told us or the apostles never told us to celebrate Easter. Um, we should commemorate the resurrection. And of course, we're going to demonstrate this evening from the scriptures, the truth about first fruits, the feast of first fruits. Now, Let's talk about what first fruits is not. I've seen a lot in the body of Christ since 1986. That's 33 years. 33 years. And I've seen a lot. And um, there's I've heard a lot of teachings on a lot of different topics. I've done a lot of teaching on a lot of different topics in a lot of places. Um, I know a lot of pastors and teachers. Um, I'm friends with some, uh, you know, and, and just a part of, of having some Christian experience, you hear things. This is why I always encourage folks to look. There's a lot of funny teachings out here, a lot of interesting teachings. Uh, you want to get to know the word for yourself. You want to get to know the Lord for yourself. You want to know, get the word for, get to know the word for yourself. Now here, and you want to get to know what God has said about himself and his kingdom. You want to get to know that for yourself. You want to get to know that through the word. Okay, now, uh, there's one particular teaching on first fruits that I'm thinking of, which may be the most fringe, one of the most fringe teachings that I've heard. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would still consider these brothers, um, I might still consider these brothers Christians and God chasers as just a point of... Uh, just a minor point here that we a major point actually that we disagree on but i don't think it's a christian deal breaker i walked into a church about 12 or 13 years ago on a sunday morning it happened to be the first sunday of the year and for that church it was first fruits sunday mm. and on and the way that this church had taught this doctrine was that every Believer mm -hmm. or every member of that church, well, they actually believe that the whole body of Christ should do it and that you should take your first paycheck of the first month of the year and bring it to church and give it to the pastor. And if that was so, so in other words, let's use this for an example. If a guy makes uh, let's, let's just make up. Let's just say uh, 50, a guy makes fifty-two thousand a year. He makes a thousand dollars a week. He makes uh, four thousand a month. You should take your four thousand dollars for the first month of the year and bring it and give it to the pastor. And they were teaching it such that when you give this money to the pastor, the rest of your year would be blessed because mm -hmm. you're dedicating your first fruits to the Lord. Mm -hmm. Now, friends. I don't know that I have the power or the evidence to say that that man is not a Christian. But I am going to say that that is so far from the truth until it's not even funny. Mm. And I want to say plainly that if that is the type of teaching you are under, I want to encourage you to read the scriptures quickly. And it's not that hard. Just read the scriptures in the word, you can sit, simply Google scriptures about first fruits. Mm -hmm. And here is, and, and I also want to toss in here tithes because tithes and first fruits 
are some of the biggest things that we used in the body of Christ to raise money. And, and, and the first thing that we need to understand about the tithe and the first fruit, all you really have to do is just simply read the scripture. That's all you have to do is just read it. It's very plain. It's very simple. They are part of the covenant that God made with Israel. Part of the covenant that God made with Israel. It wasn't speaking to the church. Uh, these these uh, laws were instituted 1,500 years before there was a church. Um, I know I hear you in radio land saying, well, Abraham tithes 500 be- years before the law. But here's what we have to understand. Abraham gave to Melchizedek. He did not tithe of his income. What he tithed was not his it was the spoils of war that he had just gotten from the five kings and he only tithed once in his entire life and and it's just a matter of simply reading the scriptures that that's all i'm doing is telling you verse by verse and word by word what the scriptures teach jesus and the apostles never talked about tithing ever The writer of Hebrews mentions it as to talk about how great Melchizedek was. Jesus made one statement about tithing while he was still under the law. He said, you tithe, listen, friends, of your mint, anise and cumin. Now, he didn't say you tithe of your money. Mm -hmm. He said you tithe of your mint, anise and cumin and you do well, but you neglect the weightier matters of the law. Now, first of all, they didn't tithe money. Neither was the first fruits money. The first fruit was never money. The tithe was never, not one verse in the entire Bible was the tithe ever associated with money, except for in Deuteronomy chapter 14. And what the word says in Deuteronomy chapter 14 about the tithe, it says, it says, we're we're connected with money. It says, go and get the grains from your field. If the grain is too much for you to carry, one-tenth of your increase means crop. One-tenth of your increase, which means crop, not money. It means crop. And take one-tenth of your crop and try to carry it with you to the festival. Mm -hmm. If you can't carry that much grain to the festival and it literally says that in Deuteronomy chapter 14 if you can't carry it then take and sell the grain and then take the money that you the proceeds from you selling the grain take that to the festival with you that when you get to the festival then you can buy whatever it is so that you and your family can eat and celebrate that is what they were supposed to do with the tithe in Deuteronomy chapter 14. All you have to do is open it up and read it, friends. I'm not making this up. And I just encourage folks that please, friends, just read the word for yourself and let it speak for itself. Let's get into first fruits. There is a powerful, powerful passage that we want to open up in Leviticus chapter 23, verses verses 9 through 14. Now, this is the word, this is the word of the Lord Himself. Do you have that passage ready or no? I do. Okay, read that passage. What are you? 9 through 14. I want you to listen carefully to the passage. And I want you to keep reading. 9 through 14. Go ahead. The Lord said to Moses. First thing I want you to notice. The Lord did not say to the church. The Lord said to Moses. And then he said to Moses, you tell the children of Israel. This is. For the children of Israel. Okay, go ahead. Speak to the to the Israelites Mm -hmm. and say to them, when you enter the land, I am going to give you and you reap its harvest. Yes. Now, reaping a harvest means I have planted something in the ground. That's what it, it means. Literal seeds into a literal soil in a literal field. And then after it germinates and after it you cultivate it and after it grows, you go out and now you reap it. 
that means grain, that means barley, that means wheat, that means corn, that means grapes, or whatever it is that you sowed. Go ahead. Bring to the priest a sheaf of the first now, grain you harvest. none of anyone alive today is a priest in this sense, directly from Levi, and a high priest directly from Aaron, okay? He's describing what's supposed to happen at a festival, at a celebration, and at a ceremony. And it's for the children of Israel. Notice, everything here is grain, not money. Continue to read. He is to wave the sheaf offering, the sheaf before the Lord, so it will be accepted on your behalf. The priest is to wave it on the day after the Sabbath. The day after the Sabbath. Very important. Go ahead. On the day you wave the sheaf, you must sacrifice as a burnt offering to the Lord a lamb a year old without defect. Okay. You are to sacrifice a lamb in the prime of his life without defect as a burnt offering. Let's get a little bit more. Together with its grain offering. Of with the grain offering now. Of two tenths of an ephah, of the finest flour mixed with olive oil, a food offering presented to the Lord, a pleasing aroma, and its drink offering of a quarter of a hen of wine. Right. So no, I want you to take note, every place in the word of God where you see tithe, except for Genesis, two places in Genesis, it's always talking about grain or something that grows in a field or something that lives in a field like a sheep or something. Now, I want you to hear this is supposed to be offered up with a burnt offering. Mm -hmm. He said, what day? It's the day after the, day the after Sabbath. The, Sabbath. the day after the Sabbath. I asked my wife the other. In fact, I think this was the passage you was reading a couple months ago. And you said, we got this all wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. As yeah. We, were, we had just really started... Um, uh, reading through the Bible. So we were very early on in the process and I was rereading in Leviticus um, one evening. And when I read about, um, you first, know, first when fruits. I read about first fruits, I was like, and so, so honestly, can I be very transparent for a moment and tell you that I read that before, before reading it a few uh, months ago, I read it before. However, what had happened to me was that um, I was allowing what I was hearing behind the pulpit to determine what I understood about first fruits. Um, so I did not do a checks and balances with what, what the word was saying. All that I ever had experienced or encountered or understood or knew about first fruits was what I heard and had been taught. Yeah. And so as when I was reading through it and my heart was open and my mind was clear, sitting in my dining room one evening and I re and I reread it and the revelation just came to me and I was like, wow, you know, I think we have it all wrong. We've had it all wrong. And it's not the same metaphorically you can't do that. But I think what's happened is that uh, the scripture has been somewhat um, abused and perverted a bit um, and, and used to uh, get folk into this practice. Um, it's almost manipulation. This, this practice of first fruits. That's not to say that you shouldn't give unto the Lord. You shouldn't give sacrificially. I'm not saying that at all. Um, but you know, I'm saying for me, <laughs> when I reread that, um, I realized that I had, um, was allowing, um, someone else's word to substitute, to be the word for me. Um, and so that, that evening that with that revelation, I realized that this principle of first fruits, um, was very clear, um, clearly explained in the word. Um, and so that was the truth that I was supposed to stand upon. I want to share some ideas with you, friends. There's a passage in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 17, and it says something to this effect. Think not, and this is Jesus talking, and most Bibles is going to be read. Think not that I come to destroy the law. For I did not come to destroy the law. It's very important that we pay attention to this passage. I didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill 
the law. He came to fulfill the law. Very, very important. Watch this. Not one yod or stroke. Or now see that would be equivalent. See the word says jot, but we're talking about in in, in Hebrew it's yod, the smallest letter. Yes. Or a tittle. Now in Hebrew the yod would be equivalent to our Y in English, and it makes the same sound as Y. Yod, not one jot, not one tittle, the crossing of a T mm -hmm. or the dot of an I. None of the law is going to pass away until all things are going to be fulfilled. Now, that's talking about the law. Mm -hmm. Very clear. Nothing in the law is going to pass away until everything in the law is going to be fulfilled. Now, what is Jesus saying? He's saying, I am the fulfillment of the law. And I came to fulfill the law. Remember, it's a covenant. It's a covenant with Israel. And once the covenant is fulfilled on both sides, the arrangement is fulfilled. You don't need it anymore. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, I came to fulfill it. Now, he's going to fulfill man's half because he's 100% man. He's going to fulfill God's half mm -hmm. because he's 100% God. So no matter how you slice it, the law is about him, the law points to him, and he fulfills it. Yes. That's Matthew chapter 5 and 17. Let's get a little bit more. There's a passage in Colossians that talks about let uh, chapter 2, let no man condemn you because you keep a day or you don't keep a uh, you don't keep a day you don't keep a new moon or you do or you don't keep a sabbath or you do or you don't keep a holiday or a festival or a new moon mm -hmm. and so forth Just don't let nobody condemn you on that stuff mm -hmm. the reason why and this is Paul writing Colossians chapter 2 makes it very clear don't let nobody condemn you as it pertains to the law mm -hmm. because it all points to Christ Colossians chapter 2 and verse 17. There's another passage in 2 Timothy chapter 3 that makes it very clear. When Paul is speaking to his young protege, uh, Pastor Timothy, who he left in Ephesus. Pastor Timothy, he's writing a, pa a personal epistle. Actually, it's a pastoral epistle. Mm -hmm. There are three e -pas pastoral epistles in the New Testament. First and second, Timothy and Titus. He's writing to his young protege, Timothy. And he said in chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, all scripture is from God and is inspired and God breathed. Yes. And it is profitable for rebuke and instruction that the man of God might be thoroughly furnished for every good work. If the man of God is going to be thoroughly furnished for every good work, he needs the word. That's what the word says. The interesting thing about it is, is 2 Timothy is talking about the Old Testament because there was no New Testament at that point. And I don't even know that as Paul is writing this letter to his young protege, I don't even know that he knew that it would end up being a part of the canon of scripture. I mean, maybe he did. Maybe the Lord gave him that revelation. But let's just assume that when Paul says that Every scripture is inspired by God, it's breathed by God, and it is profitable for instruction and for rebuke that the man of God might be equipped and thoroughly furnished for every good work. You have to trust what the word says. Mm -hmm. How are we doing on time? We're doing wonderful. Okay, we're doing good on time. Mm -hmm. Now, let's just get this word real quick. See, so the most important thing is that we remember what the word says. First thing, Leviticus chapter 23 and verse 10 makes it very clear that the passage is for Moses and Israel. Watch how Jesus fulfills this. Now, let me share something with you about this festival. Mm -hmm. As we look at the word of God, particularly in Leviticus chapter 23, yes. the Lord outlines seven different as we say in english feasts mm -hmm. or you could also say festival yeah here are some of the words that are used in the word to describe these events you may see 
gathering. You may also see convocation, particularly if you use the Old Test, the uh, King James Version. Might say convocation. I call my people together for a holy convocation. You may see those types of phrases. But the idea is that there are seven of these, as we call them in most translations, feasts or festivals. Seven. It's lined out. It's lined up real clear, yes. just like God wanted it. Perfectly. Listen, friends, how God plans things. Three, four of them are in the springtime and three are in the fall. That's by design. The first one, if I can remember, if I can go through all of them based off of just memory, the first one is Passover or in, in, in English is Passover. In Hebrew is Pesach. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it, now this is the day the, this was their last night in Egypt. Yes. We see now, as we told on the show a few months back, how it is that the feast or festival of the Passover is the perfect prophetic foreshadowing of Jesus Christ being their Passover lamb or our Passover lamb, yes. such that it delivers us from the one who had us bound. Mm -hmm. And we're free and the chains is broken and by the blood, listen, of the lamb. Mm -hmm. Just to demonstrate a little bit more, Moses told them that on the night that this death angel passes through Goshen or, or Egypt in Egypt, general, yes. but particularly even Goshen because that's where they live, you are to take a bowl of blood. Mm -hmm. You are to take a piece of hyssop. You dip the hyssop in the blood. Mm -hmm. You hit it on the top. You strike it there, blood. You strike it on this side with blood, and you strike it on that side with blood. They had no clue that they was literally making a cross. And they're eating the blood. The, excuse me. Now, they're not eating the blood. Excuse me. Leviticus chapter 17 make it very clear we're not supposed to drink blood. <laughs> sorry. Sorry about that. They're eating the lamb. Yes. And the word says, Spirit eat blood. all of the lamb. Take mm -hmm. all of the lamb inside of you. Mm -hmm. And then get ready to go. Because you're about to get delivered that night by the blood of the lamb. Praise God. Mm -hmm. That was the first festival. Mm -hmm. If I can remember, the very next day was supposed to be another festival called uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Mm -hmm. The Feast of Unleavened Bread lasted seven days. Right. If you remember that yes. from reading the yes. scriptures. From the 15th the, to the 22nd. That's right. From the 15th to the 27th, because mm -hmm. the word made it very clear mm -hmm. that the Passover was going to be on the 14th day of the first month of the year, depending on what year you either call it Abib or you call it Nizen. Yes. Okay. And, and it says right there in the passage, this will be the first month of the year for you. Yes. And on the 14th day, yes. you celebrate the Passover. Yes. Now, right after that, from the 15th to the 22nd, the children of Israel were supposed to celebrate the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Yes. Then the word says in, in Leviticus, makes it very clear. It says now, starting from the, uh, the, the Passover, mm -hmm. you go to the first Sabbath day, is what the word says. And then whatever day that is, you just count one day, the day after the Sabbath, mm -hmm. is another festival, and that's the festival of first fruits. That's what the word says. The festival of first fruits. And then the word says here the first time that they ever celebrated first fruits. Mm -hmm. Now remember, they leave Egypt, they go through the wilderness for 40 years. Mm -hmm. On the 40th year, literally 40 years to the day, and then three or four days later, they cross over into the land. And then the next year, they, so that, that year, that fall comes around, they plant barley, mm -hmm. and they plant wheat. Mm hmm and when that first harvest comes around, which would be the 41st year, the word says, go into the field and gather up a sheaf and cut it down. That's going to be your first fruit. One sheaf. Take it to a priest. Mm -hmm. 
the priest is going to take and wave, wave it the sheath. before the Lord mm -hmm. in all directions. Mm -hmm. Now, that one sheath that this person brings, the priest is waving it before the Lord according to the book of Leviticus. Mm -hmm. This then is sanctifying the whole entire field that the sheath was taken from. Mm -hmm. That's what it's representing. Mm -hmm. Then they're going to take... And burn it. And then they're going to offer a burnt offering with it with a lamb. Mm -hmm. Good God Almighty. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you see mm -hmm. the revelation in that. Think about it. The, the first fruit is happening in the springtime. Mm -hmm. What is it that we can harvest in the springtime? We can only harvest barley grows in the wintertime. And wheat grows in the wintertime. There are some things that can grow in the wintertime. But we're primarily talking about barley and wheat. We know that because the word says mm -hmm. barley and wheat. But we also know that barley and wheat can grow in the wintertime. Mm -hmm. We also know 50 days after this is another festival called Shavuot. Mm -hmm. Or in English we say, well in Greek we say Pentecost. In English is just a transliteration of the word Pentecost. Literally meaning 50 days. Mm -hmm. Praise God. Watch this. Now, the word says that the day after the Passover, they're supposed to do this ceremony, which is the first day of the week. Remember, Passover is the is the seventh, excuse me, the uh, the day after the Sabbath right. or Shabbat, mm -hmm. literally meaning rest. Uh Shabbat, the day after Shabbat is the day that they're supposed to do this, which is the first day of the week. Now, as we look at the word a little bit more, this festival to the children of Israel, first fruits, mm -hmm. represents then that they are about to celebrate new life. And the blessing of the new springtime and the life and the harvest that's about to come about. Right. A harvest they haven't even seen yet. A harvest they so haven't even done the har harvest yet. Yeah. They haven't done the harvest. Right. This is just the first fruit of it. Because mm -hmm. they only took one sheaf out mm -hmm. of, of a whole entire field. Mm -hmm. And they're celebrating new life. Now, around verse 13 and 14, the word says, now that's Leviticus 23 and 14 says, no one in Israel can eat any grains from their field mm -hmm. until this ceremony is done. That's right. You must not eat any bread or roasted or new grain until the very day you bring this offering to your God. This is to be a lasting ordinance for the generations to come wherever you live. So in other words, Israel is supposed to represent, is supposed to always remember mm -hmm. and replicate this ceremony yeah. every time they get a chance. Mm -hmm. It's a sacred assembly. And every year. Yeah. And it's a sacred assembly. Mm -hmm. One more thing about the term festival or feasts is literally in the word, in Hebrew, the word is moed. And see, we talk about seven feasts, Moedim, literally meaning God is making an appointment with his people. Mm -hmm. He wants to be with his people to celebrate them. Mm -hmm. This is a for a prophetic. We to demonstrate how there's a prophetic foreshadowing of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Notice in verse 12, there is a burnt offering. Yes. Which represents Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. That is supposed to be done with this first fruit ceremony. Mm -hmm. Verse 14 makes it very clear that once the priest does this, every other thing that you gather from that field now is acceptable. Mm -hmm. Good God Almighty. In other words, as Jews use the term today, Kosher literally means acceptable. 
that means acceptable as it pertains to meeting the criteria that God set forth. Mm -hmm. And they still use that term today, kosher. They do. Let's get a little bit more word. We're going to see as we flip it over into the New Testament how the term first fruit is always connected with resurrection and new life. You get Romans chapter 6 and verse 4. We're going to read some passages here and then we're going to get ready so that the next show can take place. What do you have there? Romans chapter 6 and verse 4. Romans chapter 6, verse 4. I'm going to get another passage. We were therefore buried with him through... Buried. Important. Buried. Buried. With him. Through baptism. Through baptism. Into death in that order. Into death. See that? Just as Christ was raised from the dead. Just as Christ was raised. Through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new New life. I like the way the King James Version say, raised to walk in the newness of life. I think I like the King James Version just because that was what I used when I first got saved. (laughs) And I just like the sound of it. most of us. (laughs) Depending on when you got saved, I guess. Depending on when you got saved. But, but, uh. There was the controversy at that time whether or not the King James Version was the best version on the planet. But let me read this passage for you. Listen to what Jesus said. Jesus said something. Here's what Jesus said. And Jesus says this about himself. Mm -hmm. And he says it about the resurrection. Listen to what he says. Truly, I say to you, John chapter 12 and verse 24, Mm -hmm. unless, what are we talking about, friends, in the book of Leviticus? Grains. Mm -hmm. Unless a grain of wheat falls. He's talking about the resurrection, his own resurrection. And it it, has been other passages in this chapter that tells you that that's what he's talking about. Unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it remains alone. Mm. And he's also talking about you and me. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. And I know it's also talking about me and you because of verse 25. He who loves his life will lose it. But he who is willing to give up his life and this world will keep it. He's also talking about individuals. Look at verse 26. Mm-hmm. If anyone, that's why context is always important. I could take any one of these passages out of context and make it say whatever I want. But you have to look at the whole context. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. Where I am, my servant will be. If anyone serves me, the father will honor him. Mm. If you don't serve him, then the father won't honor you. Mm. we got a lot of folks with titles, but they're not serving him. Mm. And the father doesn't honor them. We just, just reading the word. That's all we're doing. But let's talk about that grain. He's talking about a grain. If I just take a grain and drop it on the ground, it's just going to sit there. Mm-hmm. If I just take a piece of grain and just drop it on the table, it's just going to sit there. But if I dig a hole for it, and if I drop it in the ground and Mm -hmm. cover it over and water it, Mm -hmm. now that's different. Mm -hmm. That's a different story. Because then what's going to happen, the water is actually going to cause it to rot. The husk, Mm -hmm. the shell, it'll start to rot. It dies. And it breaks down. But it's an opportunity for new Mm -hmm. life. Because when the the, the cover and the crust and the husk and the hull of the old seed breaks down and starts to rot. What's inside of the seed now gets an opportunity for life, mm-hmm. particularly if you put it in good soil. And that's the stuff that grows. And once the grain or the tree or whatever it is grows, there are many thousands more pieces of fruit mm-hmm. 
first fruit. The seed is the first fruit. Mm -hmm. The first one that we put there. That, that come as a result of the first one dying. And conversely, you can flip that over. That when you die. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about me and you. Yes. Now, we're not talking about a physical death. But we're talking about a death to self. A death to the flesh. That when you die and determine that you're going to live a life that honors God. Mm -hmm. Then you can't even imagine what God can multiply from it. Absolutely incredible. Remember, the word says the first day of the week. Mm -hmm. If you remember that, let me read a passage real quick in, in Romans chapter 8 and verse 22. Look at what the word says. L listen to the connection. Listen to the connection. For we know the whole creation groans. Mm -hmm. And suffers pain of childbirth together until now. Listen to the, script, the scriptures now. Listen to the scriptures. We're talking about resurrection. And now only this, but, and, and not only this, but also we ourselves having the first fruits mm -hmm. of the spirit. Even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. First fruit then is connected with new life and resurrection. Let's get a little bit. We're going to get a little bit more. We're going to get. Oh, yes. There's there's also a part that we need to consider. There's a burnt offering with it. If we look at Romans chapter 12, if you can remember that passage. There's a burnt offering in the book of Leviticus. So now when you mm -hmm. take the first fruit out of the field, mm -hmm. there's also a burnt offering. We're still talking about new life the whole time. New life the whole time. Listen to what the word says when we talk in the New Testament, when we talk about. The burnt offering. We're talking about the burnt offering. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present yes. your bodies. Yes. It's a, it's a burnt offering. As a living sacrifice. sacrifice. What do you do with sacrifices? You burn them. How do you get the sacrifice? Someone presents it. Paul is saying, we need to present ourselves. As the sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Remember we talked about kosher right? Mm -hmm. Accepted. Acceptable. Mm -hmm. Holy and acceptable. Mm -hmm. To God. That means the right kind of sacrifice. Which is your spiritual act of worship. So in other words. It was a form of worship. Before. Such that they offered sacrifices. Mm -hmm. But Paul is using that same analogy to say now. You offer yourself as the sacrifice that is kosher and holy and acceptable unto God. And that now is your act of worship. Let's slip over to 1 Corinthians real quick. And we're just going to see what the word says. Chapter 15. Now, some of us who are Bible students, we know what 1 Corinthians, the minute you hear 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the first thing you think of is resurrection. Mm -hmm. And the second thing you think of is rapture. Mm -hmm. So whether you believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, mm -hmm. whether you believe in a post-tribulation, single second coming type of rapture, or whether you believe in a three and a half year pre-wrath rapture, However it is that you believe in the rapture, most of those teachings come from second, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And the most of the chapter is talking about resurrection. Yes. But now let's get some of the word here. Let's start at verse 12 and let's see what the word says. Oh, yes. Interesting thing about it. The first few verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 actually includes the resurrection 
as being an integra- uh, uh, integral and intricate mm-hmm. part of the gospel. You can't really have gospel without having resurrection. Because the good news is good, but the resurrection makes it better. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Because if he would have just died and stayed in the grave, then our faith would be in vain. But not only did he die on the cross to wash our sins away, not just for the remission of our sins, but literally to wash them away. Mm -hmm. But now we're talking, he rose again, demonstrating that he is God in a body. Now listen what the word says. Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, now how do some among you say that there is no resurrection. Hmm. So we're preaching that Christ raised from the dead. So how is it that you're saying that he didn't? If there is no resurrection of the dead, Hmm. not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ had not been raised, then our preaching is in vain. And your faith is also in vain. Moreover, we are found, we are even found to be false witness of God because we testify against God that he raised Christ, mm-hmm. whom he did not raise, if in fact the dead are not raised. Strong, strong point. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ had even been raised. Verse 17, and if Christ had not been raised, your faith is worthless. And you are still in your sins. Verse 18. Mm -hmm. Then all those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. That means once life is over, it's over. But that's not what the word teaches. See, that's what Paul is saying. You got to believe that there is a life after you go to sleep. See, so when I draw my last breath, that's just a different phase of life. It's life outside of this body. Listen to what the word says. Verse 19. If we have hope in Christ, if we have hope in Christ in this life only, Mm -hmm. we are of all men to be pitied Mm -hmm. or to be pitied or or most miserable. That's the King James Version. Mm -hmm. Now, if only our hope came because of what we accomplish in this life. My Lord. Just because I got a degree or I brought a house or I have an image or a mm-hmm. a legacy. Mm-hmm. If that's all you live for and you think life is over after that, well, then you're really a miserable person. And I'm I'm just reading the word. But now Christ has been raised from the dead. Listen to what the word says. The first fruits. <laughs> <laughs> Of those who are asleep. For since by man came death, taught the first man came death, that, that, that would be Adam. Mm-hmm. A man also came, and by a man also came the resurrection from the dead. Mm-hmm. And that's talking about Jesus Christ. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all are made alive and given new life. And Jesus is the first fruit of that. Amen. The book of John chapter. There's a passage in John. Believe us. There's a passage in John that makes it very clear. It's like we read in Leviticus. That after the Passover. You go. The first Sabbath. And the very next day. You take the first fruit. Mm -hmm. Out of the field. Mm -hmm. We know Jesus was the Passover lamb. Mm -hmm. And after the Sabbath, the word says in the book of John, the first thing in the morning, early in the morning, right after the Sabbath, Mm -hmm. Jesus rose (laughs) from the grave and from the dead. Listen, listen, friends. No man took his life. But he laid it down. 
And since he laid it down, this is what he said. Mm -hmm. He has the power to take it back up again. And since he can die and rise at will, he can also give us new life. Amen. What a beautiful, beautiful prophetic picture. Jesus is the first fruit. The first fruit festival in the book of Leviticus chapter 20, chapter uh, 23. Mm -hmm. Literally a celebration of new life. Looking forward to the blessing that is about to come the next year. Mm -hmm. Because that was the first month of the year when that happened. Yes. And Jesus Christ dying on the cross being the first to raise up from the dead and give us the blessing mm -hmm. of new life. What a beautiful, beautiful prophetic picture. Amen. Wow. Well, friends, the worst part of the show is upon us. It's the part that I hate the most, and it's the part that you hate the most, the part where we have to close out the show. Uh, it is very unfortunate. But, hey, thank you for the opportunity yes. to come and share with you on your cell phones, on your computers, and your automobiles, in your living rooms, however it is that you listen to the Just Word Show right here on Awesome God Radio. We are very, very thankful that you're sharing it, you're blowing it up, and you're making the devil mad every time that you click. Yes. Every time that you like it, the devil gets upset. So we're, we're just very, very thankful that we are making a difference and we're pushing back the kingdom of darkness. So we always do. Uh, we always encourage folks to read the Word of God. Yes. Get to know it for yourself. Mm -hmm. That when something counterfeit uh, presents itself, you can recognize it instantaneously. Not because you studied the counterfeit, but because you know the truth. And because you studied the truth so much, when something doesn't fit the truth, you yes. automatically know it. Yes. That's why I always tell folks to read it all the way through multiple times. Mm -hmm. And I always tell folks to memorize large portions of it early and often. Because if you get it in your heart... If you write it on the tables of your heart, mm -hmm. you get to know the God that you claim to serve. Yes. And it does not matter what anyone else says that you can't make me doubt him because now I've read enough yeah. and I know too much about him. Until next week, friends, continue to make 2019 a just word year. Yes. Until next week, God bless you. God bless you.